And I don't want to hear about you don't have the things that I have. Do the work first. I'm in 100% agreement with doing the work first. Mm. I'm also in agreement with, I got to work twice as hard. So what? The work is not the same. The guy who is not athletically inclined has to work harder than the guy who's athletically inclined. Guess what? That's how it goes. Dr. Rowdy Ferguson, yes, uh, thank sir. you very much for joining me today. Um, yes, yeah, so maybe just to, to kind of start officially, I, uh, I came across you, uh, yourself and your, your work through a, a YouTube video, actually. Um, uh, I think it was titled uh, 10 Overqualified MMA Fighters. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, and it, it sent me down the rabbit hole and I, you know, I kind of dipped into all of them. But you were really like an impressive uh, person on that list and so just for the the viewers that that uh don't know you um i'll just do a quick rundown of some of the things that you've done here um if anything's wrong just you know give me a shout but i also i had to condense it of course because i was looking on wikipedia and your <laughs> website and it's man i was like this is gonna take up the whole podcast long, long list it's a long, you got list. a long list of things man it was uh, it's crazy so you have a bachelor's in mechanical engineering mm. uh, master's in teaching and a phd mm. in education where you got a 4.0 GPA. So for us Europeans, it's like straight A's, I guess. Um, you were, while you were in college, you were one of the only few students to compete in three sports while you were there, wrestling, football, and track. Mm -hmm. You are a fifth degree black belt in judo, uh, third degree, sixth degree. Okay, someone needs to update. I think that's maybe Wikipedia. Um, third, third degree black belt, fourth degree now. Okay, fourth degree black belt in jiu-jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You are a four-time national judo champion, a 2004 Olympian. You have an MMA record of 3-0. and uh, You were the head coach of the Bahamas Judo Federation. And in 2017, you got inducted into their Hall of Fame. You are an author. You have a book, uh, Coffee with Rowdy. Uh, you're an editor for martial arts and strength and conditioning journals. And alongside all that, you run a successful judo dojo, uh, dojo in Tampa, Florida. Yes, sir. That is really quite an impressive list, man. I uh, I was going through it with my girlfriend yesterday, and she said, you're like the guy from Limitless who can just unlock all parts of his brain and just excel in everything he's doing. So probably the, the broadest question is, mm. how did all that happen? How did, maybe if we start from the beginning, where, where was the motivation? Was this all planned, or was it just, uh, was it drilled into you through family, or how, how did my that start? Family, my, my mom and dad. My mom and dad, my um, my dad was a Heisman Trophy candidate at uh, Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin. He was the um, first thousand yard rusher at the University of Wisconsin. He's also a professional football athlete. He's also an academic All-American at the University of Wisconsin. And my mom went to the University of Miami where she graduated in, my mom graduated in 22 months, 24 months or 22 months, something crazy like that. Okay. Four year degree in like 22, 24 months. Um, my mom is in a, she's a retired attorney my parents were really sticklers, man, for the, on the academic side. Um, I don't remember my parents really urging me or pushing me much athletically, but they pushed me in terms of excellence. Mm -hmm. like, no matter what I did, I had to do it at a, at a high level. My mom always used to say, uh, once a task is once begun, never leave it till it's done. Be the labor great or small, do it well or not at all. Oof. And it was constant. I'm talking book reports in the summer and reading lists. And I mean, just, just everything was, had to be at a high level. Um, I thought it was strict when I was young. I love it. Now I even told my dad yesterday, I told my dad, I said, man, you are, you are awesome. Dad. I said, my dad never missed a track meet, never missed a football game, never missed a wrestling match. I mean, he never missed anything. The only time my dad missed missed a uh, an event it was when I was in college and it's not possible for him to try. I'm playing three sports in college. I'm, I started in, in all three at different at various times. It's not possible for him to make all those trips when I was yeah, in college. Yeah. But when I was coming up from young, when I was in high school and, and um, I was in junior high school, they call it middle school. Now my parents never missed anything like never. 
And a lot, a lot of that comes from that particular background. A lot of it, a lot of it comes from my Caribbean background and Caribbean heritage, um, which is a little bit different. I, I grew up, I grew up inside of the African American experience, but I have a Caribbean background, and um, it's 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 a little bit different. It, it adds a little bit of of different flavor to the rearing process. And I, I appreciate all of it. And I appreciate the, the the cultural potpourri that was developed for me being in the United States, being born in the U.S., and having grandparents on both sides that were born in the Bahamas. And my parents being first generation Americans. Okay, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting that you bring that up. Actually, that wasn't uh, as in your your heritage from the Caribbean. I uh, it was something I looked into, but I didn't think to bring up today. But maybe we can get to it in a bit. But um, okay. but just to just to, to still focus on your college years, you, I guess you had some diverse interests when you were uh, back in college and you, you were involved in a lot. I mean, your bachelor's was of course uh, mechanical engineering, but also you did three different sports. So was this, um, was this like a plan to keep your options open or was it just like putting your feelers out there to see what, what you, because you, you'd also been doing judo from a young age, right? Yes. I started judo from the age of six to 12 and then, um, I stopped doing judo and I wrestled one year in ninth grade. I was in junior high school, never wrestled in high school. And the first day on the mat in college, I beat the number one heavyweight there and was in the starting line. <laughs> I went to school, I went to Howard University on a football scholarship. I graduated from high school at 17. So when I got to Howard University, I was 17 years old. And at 17 years old, I became the starting running back that season. My God. Um, I ended up getting injured because I think my body was not mature enough to bang against some of those those older. I, I know it wasn't, and I ended up getting injured. Um, and a lot of injuries kind of plagued my my football career a little bit. I mean, I had a shoulder surgery, um, had ACL surgery. Um, I also had a, a fracture of the Franc, which was horrible. A broke foot. If you never, if you don't know what a Franks fracture is man look it up it is a horrible fraction of foot I broke my foot in my in my fifth year my senior season and I just we just taped it up man and and kept playing and then on the off week we put a cast on it and then came out the cast and they were calling me little leg because my leg <laughs> was little. um and they just kind of spatted it up and wrapped my foot up and I still played um but I think I remember people saying when you go to college man it's going to be the best time of your life make sure you you do everything that you want to do because you're not going to be able to do that type of stuff again and it's true because you know how to say youth is wasted on the young I didn't want I didn't want to waste my youth I had an opportunity to play three sports in college I I I did judo when I was young I didn't wrestle in high school Wrestling looked really similar to judo. I just said, let me step out there and try it. I was playing football. When I played football, I think the formula is if you play what's called a skilled position in football, in American football, you have to run track. If you're a linebacker or a D lineman, you have to wrestle. Running track, which is something that you did when you played football. I played football in, in the fall. I ran track in the spring. And then I wrestled too. Hmm. And so my... I have people used to ask me, say, Does, isn't wrestling and track during the same season? I say, yes. <laughs> Five, it was six o'clock, wrestling and practice in the morning, and then track practice in the evening. Man. Horrible. <laughs> it's like a movie, man. How do you do it? And then in the day, you're taking classes and still getting taking classes, man, taking classes yeah. and studying. That's uh... and pleasure and fraternity, and then trying to maintain some type of social life. It was rough. Oh yeah, man. Yes. So I guess it's paying dividends now. <laughs> great, time. great time. I had a great time. And I went to an awesome school. Um, I went to Howard University. Howard. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. I just uh, saw your Chadwick, uh, your Chadwick avatar. I know he's an alumni yeah. as well, right? Yeah. We went to Howard at the same time. Ah, okay. We went to Howard at the same time. And um, our current vice president, Kamala Harris, also went to Howard University. Ah, yeah. So that's, True. That's kind of cool. So, yeah, man. That's uh, it's a nice university. I think it's, uh, it's got some nice alumni coming through. Yes. Um, but yes, so as we're saying, a lot of this takes up a lot of time. Um, but uh, 
as you like move towards like your career, you start to get out of college and stuff. Did you um, strategize where, I guess you were moving from one goal to the next, I suppose. I mean, Olympics must be kind of a very dominant part of that. Um, I didn't really, I didn't think about the Olympics at all until 1996. I was mm-hmm. in the kitchen. Um, I just got done watching Jimmy Pedro on a highlight because it didn't show it real time. They showed it later. Uh, win the, the Olympic bronze medal in judo. And I told my mom, I said, yeah, I think we're going to the Olympics. <laughs> she said, for what? I said, for judo. She said, yeah, right. That was all I needed, buddy. <laughs> that was it. Um, I thought I was going to the NFL when I graduated from college. Uh, the Detroit Lions flew me up, brought me in for physical and everything. And they said, hey, we're probably going to pick you up uh, as a free agent when the draft is over. I think in the like sixth or seventh round, he ended up picking up another running back and the call never came. And my agent was like, hey, man, you want to play in the Canadian Football League? Canadian Football League at the time, was the league minimum was $27,500. Canadian dollars. Okay. Um, my job that I was offered by Texas Instruments at the time in 1997 was $40,800 US dollars. <laughs> <laughs> That's a no-brainer for running up and down the field to get your head caved in or sit at a desk and make some money. The problem was, I don't think my heart was in either one of them. I don't think my heart was in playing football anymore. And after I got to Texas Instruments, my heart damn sure was not in technical sales and sitting behind a desk and then calling on customers and then, you know, being left in the lobby and being treated like, like, like dung. Um, So, 1998 rolls around. I'm, I'm training at the time. 1998 rolls around. I go to the U.S. Open and I fight a guy by the name of Nicholas Gill from Canada. Really, really good judo player. And I, I get beat. I get beat, but I don't get dominated, but I get beat. Um, I get beat solidly. Let me say I got beat solidly. I don't he didn't steamroll over me. It was my first time being in that level of competition. Um, but I mean, he beat me solidly. Um, I came through into the repertoire and ended up being uh, in third place that day in the U.S. Open. I also had the opportunity to beat the number one judo player in the country at the New York Open a couple months before that. So that put me on the on the roster for the United States. I was number two in the country in a matter of what, maybe eight months. <laughs> I was having some problems with my supervisor at, at Texas Instruments putting a little extra pressure on me. And he flew into town and he had a conversation with me. And I listened to what he said. I nodded my head. And by the time he got back to his office in Chicago, I had fax my resignation letter over and i was hired by the i was hired by his boss the national director of technical sales and he was a regional director and that turned everything upside down he went from jumping on my case to begging me to stay i said no i'm 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 out of here i said i don't need these manufactured problems that you all are creating here you know and i was i can say this i was I'm 45 now. I'll be 46 this year. I graduated from Howard University. I was 22 years old. By the time I went out to California and I was working that particular job with Texas Instruments, I was with 23. I was 23 years old. I had been around high level, intelligent black folks for the last five years of my life. And I had walked around what, we, what you would call a modern day Wakanda. And I was a, I was a freshwater fish that got thrown into a saltwater environment. Like all of a sudden, everything around me and my whole environment changed. And everything that I was, everything that I was taught from K through 12, I found out that a lot of those things weren't true. 
And then the things that I learned at Howard University, and I learned about myself, and I learned about people, and I learned about experiences, I found out that those things were true. They were true about me. And my 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 personal self-awareness and my personal self-confidence and my first personal self-concept and my personal self-esteem had grown because I wasn't I wasn't beat down for being who I was or what I was in that environment. So I came out into the world as an empowered African-American male. And as an empowered African-American male, I don't think that they were used to seeing what that looks like. So that type of empowered African-American male from the, from the proving ground of Howard University looks like arrogance or what they would call the uppity Negro in the United States. I wasn't having any of the foolishness that they were talking about or bringing to me or the foolishness that they would talk about the car around the coffee pot when they were eating donuts and the um the business as usual conversations and the good old boys club because i was who i was these were older guys with guts and just a bunch of a bunch of chat as we, we would call it and it was an oil and water mix i don't think they were used to somebody checking them when they said things that were incorrect. And it didn't bother me. And I can give you the, what happened. And I um, we went to Atlanta to, it was a technical conference. I got, I get up early in the morning to work out. So I got up early in the morning to work out. Boom, I hit the technical conference as soon as it opened at eight. I was there from eight to 12. I saw every customer, every list that I had to see. I came back did my sales and contact reports all done by 2 p.m. They got up later around nine or 10. When they came back later on in the day, around four or five, I was in the lobby with one of my friends that I went to school with from Howard. She and I are in the lobby talking it up and laughing and having a good time. I'm dressed down now. I don't have my shirt and tie on anymore. When they cut, when the cadre of these people, when they come back in, they see me look, looking like I'm in Atlanta, just hanging out with all the, you know, with all the, you know, <laughs> in Atlanta chilling. So they go and tell. And the regional director calls me and I mean, he starts jumping on my case and harping on my case and says, hey, man, I need you to buy me a ticket. I'm coming out there to see you. And I told him, I said, I'm not buying your ticket. I'm not your secretary. You have a secretary in your office. You buy your own ticket. He said, well, some of my guys, you know, when I usually come to see them, they usually get my ticket. I said, well, this is a situation that is not going to be usual for you. I said, so you get your own ticket and you let me know when you're coming in town. He got his ticket. He came in town and he ran through and, you know, you can't be going on these trips and just, you're not here to hang out and do all this stuff and blah, 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 boom, boom, boom. I said, hold on for a second, sir. I got up, went in my office, you know, we had the manila filing system then. I grabbed all the, the manila folders and I laid out all the, the call, what they call sales reports and call reports on the table. He looked, he looked on and says, he said, you, you did all this in Atlanta? I said, yes. With the, with the sales charts and who's in what organization, all charted out, everything. He said, I didn't know this. I said, you didn't ask. I said, and that's the problem that I have with you. I said, you didn't ask. You just came in here off of somebody else's word and your assumption of what I did or what I didn't do. Mm. He backpedaled. He apologized. By the time he left his office, man, and got on the plane, I had tendered my resignation. Now, understand this. I was the I was nominated for technical sales person of the year. I covered all of the West Coast, all the way up to Vancouver, down to Mexico. All right. My numbers were better than anybody else's numbers that year. And I was thriving. Everything was going great. I just, I did not want to put up with that. And I, I see some of my friends who are still in the corporate American environment and some of them are doing well. And some of them have been, they, they just beat down and others are, they've chosen to sell a little piece of themselves off in order to get what they want. And then there are others who have moved up the ladder enough so they can create transformative change within their organization so that the organization feels a little bit better and it has a little better what we call cultural competency in it. Mm. But I, I had a great time. It was just, it wasn't for me. I wanted to, I wanted to do judo. I wanted to compete. 
I left that job, left everything, and moved to the Olympic Training Center. And Andy Liddy gave me an opportunity to go out to the Olympic Training Center on a training special, which you have six months to make your, to earn your medal, basically. And in that six months, I ended up getting a, a an opportunity to be a full-time resident at the Olympic Training Center. That's, that's how it happened, man. Oish. It's like you're, uh, just through sheer hard work, you're finding this constant fuck you position. You know, it's this, uh, yeah, yeah. You have to. And I think the hard work in life increases what I tell some of my clients. It increases your, your fuck you quotient. Because that, that has to increase if you're going to do what you want to do or do what you need to do in life. Yeah, I, uh, no, I, you know, commend it. It's crazy. It's uh, maybe just in, in that sense, what's your, uh, I, I almost hate to ask this question because I feel it's kind of one of these like uh, popular YouTube bullshit questions, but uh, what's your daily routine? Like what, what, what kind of things do you have that you, you don't miss um, each day or, or do you have one? I don't know. I, I imagine you do. Um, working out in the morning. I, I, I missed a couple times. I just recently went, went through a divorce and it kind of threw my, my, my routine off a little bit. So mm. I had to Sorry. really, yeah, it was, it was exciting. I had to, <laughs> I had to, I had to kind of restructure and recalibrate my routine. My routine is always, man, I'm up in the morning and I'm working out. That's it. I get up in the morning, I work out. I either, if I'm doing cardio, I'll do my meditation during that time. If I'm not doing cardio and I'm working out, then I'll do my meditation probably a little bit afterwards. Um, uh, I do my meditation, then I get up and I, I write my, my emails for the day. And then I put fires out because there's always a fire to put out. And then I, um, I do some of my audio work and my video work, get stuff off to my, my team in, in Pakistan. And then when I start getting my ready, and then I spend some time with my kids, talk to my kids or get myself ready for, for practice in the evening. And then I, I go to practice in the evening and I teach in the evening and then I'm, I'm back home. Okay. This uh, team in Pakistan, what's, what's that for? Sorry. Um, I have a, I have a team of virtual assistants uh, that I use. Ah, yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> After reading the book, the four hour work week by um, Tim Ferriss. Yeah. yeah. I, it's, uh, I, I outsource it in that particular fashion. Yeah. I would, uh, I, it's on the shelf. It's uh, on the, to, to read part of the shelf, but it's, uh, I'm really interested in that. Yeah. So, just, so it's been there for three years. Oh man, I, I'm ad I'm addicted to buying books. You know, it's, that's my problem. So I'll buy a book, and then in the new batch there'll be one book that I really want to read, and then I'll read that one first, and then I'll buy another five before I've read that one, and then it's. Man, uh, I, got, I had the same problem. I, I I'm starting to get rid of my books because mm. I want to downsize. All right, because my kids are getting older. I got one that's ten and one that's fourteen, and in the next, you know, you know, the next eight, you know, I don't want to keep acquiring more books and more stuff. So I'm starting to offload and offload, but I really miss, like I really miss going through my, you know, my, the book uh, and going through and, and earmarking stuff and highlighting and underlining and taking my notes. But I, I've moved over to a lot of, um, a lot of audio books, but there's audio books and I still grab the, the, the journals, the magazines, the Harvard business reviews. And I, cause you still have to, you have to still take in high level information that allows you to think critically and move away from, you know, things that are just fed to you on the news that are provided because your, your ear itches yeah. and it wants to be scratched with that particular thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like, um, it reminds me sometimes of when they say of, uh, what's it called? Um, when you work out and you just do the same patterns over and over again, this kind of overload, uh, you know, you kind of have to stretch yourself in a different way. You can't just have, um, social media about. news yeah exactly you you exactly it. it gets caught in the routine and then what happens you go through the process of detraining mm. it's yeah, not yeah. New. It's not yeah new that's enough. for me it's this uh thomas soul book at the moment it's like the biggest book of errors like 600 pages or so and it's you know it's dense but luckily it's you know it's economics in uh plain english let's say there's no graphs or so but it's yes. it's still like a a challenge to even read it you know um it's, it's crazy because he'll say and I'm I, and I don't say it in an arrogant fashion. I say it in a true fashion. I, I I consider myself to be pretty well read on those particular topics and those and those discussions, especially as they relate to the Black diaspora and the African American community 
And what Thomas Sowell is saying, he's saying the same thing that, um, almost the same exact thing, if you if you've ever listened on from the economic side, as Louis Farrakhan says, that they're um, they're almost in harmony. Um, and the same thing as um, what's the guy's Mike? What is his name? Mike, um, Killer Mike. The Killer same Mike, thing yeah. that Killer, Killer Mike. <laughs> Killer Mike reads a lot of Thomas Sowell. He loves Thomas Sowell. Hmm. And the one another controversial figure in the United States, I mean, politically and for African Americans, is I think I forget her that last name, but Candace, I forget the last Candace, Candace Owens. Owens, yeah. Yeah. And it, that's Candace Owens also reads a lot of Thomas Sowell. So there are some things that overlap, which Thomas Sowell says, that Killer Mike says, that Candace Owens says, that Farrakhan says that are in the same vein of, of what Booker T. Washington was, was purporting at the time back in the day when him and W.E.B. Du Bois were having their, their difference of opinion on how to increase or elevate the, the black race. Mm. But at the end of the day, the areas that those type of individuals agree with the Republican Party, if you will, is that of, man, personal responsibility. And if that it, personal responsibility and personal empowerment is, that's the way for anybody. Hmm. The question is, how can this personal empowerment take place and where does it happen? Yeah. If we if we if we move the discussion, let's just take the same political discussion and make it a socio political discussion, and bring it right into the realm of of, of judo and jujitsu or wrestling or sambo. So, the personal empowerment needs to happen, all right. But the the skill acquisition needs to happen, the technical practices need to happen. But where do they happen? So you, me, someone else, we're all looking for a place to get the things that I just discussed. So where do you acquire this particular technique? Well, it just so happens that the places for you to acquire this particular technique costs what? It costs money. Now on the personal empowerment side, it doesn't cost anything for you to go outside and run. It doesn't cost anything for you to, to, to do push-ups, sit up some squats. It doesn't cost anything for you to do all things that you can do. So there's a, there's a faction of people that said, you know, if you maximize everything that you can do, you'd be surprised on the, on the rebates and the opportunities and the things that you get in this other area. But if you whine and you're not doing anything, then I don't want to hear about you don't have the things that I have. Do the work first. I'm in 100% agreement with doing the work first. Mm. I'm also in agreement with I gotta work twice as hard. So what? The work is not the same. The guy who is not athletically inclined has to work harder than the guy who's athletically inclined. Guess what? That's how it goes. Mm. If you're in a race and somebody's faster than you, what do you gotta do to beat them? And you can run <laughs> fast. Yeah. I can't run any faster. Yeah, it's it's weird. Like sport is often this kind of um I don't know how you say it. it's it's very undemocratic in a way I mean in a sense we all of course agree to certain rules and you know we're not cheating of course like we're demo uh, democratic in that sense like we all agree to play the same game to start the same point and whatever but there's of course this thing of you know it's not a case of everyone can win you know it, it's this uh it, it put it, it it how do I say it, it kind of teases or like pinches a nerve of some of these um modern day um movements or so or or like narrative modern day, modern day um conceptual framework yeah, uh, yeah yeah i don't i don't believe oh i believe in a in that equal playing field i believe in fair play mm. i don't mm. believe everything is going to be fair for you all the time. It's not possible for us to all get on the, on the starting line and everybody finish at the same time. The issue of the, the issue is 
what happens when the starting line moves for certain people. Mm. There, there's absolutely nothing we can do about that because Frederick Douglass said years ago, power does not consider itself. There's no way, if you and I are sitting at a table and we're talking and, I, and I'm holding the gun, you can't tell me, Dr. Ferguson, I don't really feel comfortable having this conversation with you because you're holding the gun. Mm. Would you mind me holding the gun? I said, no, I'm not giving you the gun for us to have the conversation. I said, just trust me, man, I'm not going to shoot you. But me holding the gun changes how you talk. Mm. Certainly, correct? Yeah, that, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how what I'm telling you that I'm going to do with the gun because I have the gun. It changes how you talk. Not only does it change how you talk, but in your mind, you're thinking, I need to get that what? Gun. More so than the conversation. So then what happens is people are trying to snatch and grab other people's power that and it doesn't matter how they acquired it. It doesn't matter if you got your gun because your granddaddy passed the gun down to you. It doesn't matter if somebody stole your gun 15, 20 years ago and you want to get your gun back. You, you, you don't have the gun now and you have to find a way to level out the playing field without thinking that you have to kill somebody to do it. And then there's a level of there's a, then there's a level of personal satisfaction and honor in doing things the right way and understanding the phrase of do thy duty which is best leave unto the Lord the rest just do the best you can with what you have don't get caught up in the acquisition or acquiring of things that you can't take with you you can't take any of these things with you. The only thing that you, the only thing that you get, you get to leave a legacy. You can leave a financial legacy. You can leave an educational legacy. Um, you can leave a, a a property type of legacy. Like you can leave a, a athletic legacy. Like there, there are things that you can leave, but you can't take any of it with you. Even the Bible speaks about this, man. You will toil all day long for the acquiring of money that somebody else will spend. If you have children, you are literally, if you're, if you're a parent, you are literally working for money to be spent by somebody else. Even, if, even the money that you don't save. You go to work, you pay all your bills, and you have children. The money that you worked for, somebody else is spending. So you spend. You may have got to spend it once, but somebody else is spending. That's that's just how it goes. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's uh, it seems almost cliche now to say that like social media is kind of changing our perspectives or how um, social media kind of catalyzes certain you know extremities. Let's say, but it seems to be like nowadays this. Uh, well, let's say this idea of equality gets rounded up as just a, an umbrella term, whereas actually there's, there's much more nuance to it. And it's, you know, equality of, of opportunity is much different than equality of outcome, you know, and it, there's... Um, uh, and, and people, let me tell you something, people conflate the following. I'm reading a book right now called Racism Without Racists by Dr. Edward Bonilla. And it's a great book because... A lot of people think when you talk about something that you're calling somebody racist, I don't believe that there are many overt racists in, in the world. Are there some? Yeah. I don't believe there are many, mm. truly. Um, and what I think that people have a, a hard time understanding is that racism can't exist without racists. People don't understand covert racism, Overt racism, systemic racism, implicit racism, white supremacy, and the difference among all those things, they conflate all of them and the word prejudice. And if you're not in an environment where you have, when you understand the academic definition of these particular terms, you will get in a discussion with people on a colloquial level and you'll use words like racism, white supremacy, and, and start throwing things out. And a person from an academic standpoint who understands the, the differences amongst the, among these terms, 
they they won't be able to have a conversation with you because you're not going to understand what they're saying and what you're saying to them sounds like a bunch of garbled jumbled up foolishness people get fed a lot of things on social media and they they don't want to hear from the academic elite because they believe the academic elite are snobs. And then it's like Tom, Tom Nichols wrote in his book, The Death of Expertise. They no longer respect the expertise of a person. Mm. So what happens in social media is when the expert comes in and says something, somebody will Google a Google something that's one point that's contradictory to that expert. <laughs> and then try to debunk the work of the expert. We saw this with Dr. Fauci. We see this on online with with expert. We see this when people go to a when people go to a doctor, a medical doctor. <clears throat> when they get a diagnosis that they don't like, what do they go do? They google it. No, they go get a second what? Ah, oh, second opinion. <laughs> okay, now are they really looking for a second opinion or are they looking for an opinion that they want to hear? Yeah. Something that makes them easy. Okay. So, <laughs> so when you get a bad, when you get, when you get a bad diagnosis, the same thing you do, you say, I want to get a second. Opinion. When you get a good diagnosis, do you go get a second opinion? <laughs> oh. When you get a good diagnosis, you walk out and say, Oh, I'm feeling good. I got a clean bill of health. You don't say, Hey man, I'm going to get a second opinion because I need another data point to make sure that yours is true. Mm. What you say is I, I I'm feeling good. When you get a bad diagnosis, you go get a second opinion. Now that if those two opinions match up, guess what you do? You go get a what? You go get another opinion. And then you sit down and you tell your friends, well, Dr. A and Dr. B said this, but Dr. C said this. You, you don't want to listen to the experts. What you want to do is you want to go find the thing that, that you agree with and you want to hitch your wagon onto that. And that's okay. But you cannot think that all opinions are the same. There's a reason why people are hired for their expertise because they're hired for their expert opinion. Mm. But there's, there's this thing going on right now called the death of expertise. And social media is a huge part of it where someone believes that their Google search can trump the work and the research and the and the and the journals and the and I'm talking about academic articles of a of an exemplar in their field. It's, it's, not, it's not going to happen. It doesn't yeah. happen. Specifically like this year, I mean with well last year with COVID, you know, it's uh of course, it brought science into the to the, the mainstream conversations of the world, I guess, and and it kind of highlighted for me at least the like simply the, the scientific illiteracy of people of the general population. You know, just a a, a general yes. how bar how low the bar is for you know as they say you know uh, a person can be smart and people are stupid. You know, it's of course it's this um it's almost like the the how do I say this the, the it's the Dunning Kruger effect. Ah, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm not familiar with that. You have to explain that one, sorry. The Dunning Kruger effect is when people are dumb, they don't know they're dumb. <laughs> yeah. No, and they believe that they're smart, right? Exactly. It's the Dunning. It's called the Dunning Kruger effect. Yeah, yeah, they're dumb, but they don't know that they're dumb, mm. and they believe that they're smart. And then they, and then what happens is, if you look at the pyramidic structure of intelligentsia or intellect the what we call the smart people that are the intellects are the top and those which are struggling are at the bottom but those people accept what's called argumentum ad populum which means if everybody's saying it then it must be what true, be true yeah. so there's more of them than there is of of you so they believe, I said, well, if everybody's saying it, it must be true. Yeah, but all of you all that are saying it, you don't, you, <laughs> yeah. you don't know. Now, the problem with that is that population of people, as I said before, is greater in number than the people at the top. So what you have is a 
um, either educational or academic or intellectual aristocracy. Boom. Let's move. Let's move. Let's remove the preamble from those words and just and just talk about an aristocracy. People don't like an aristocracy because the aristocracy means the people who have ruled over the what the have nots. But the haves rule over the have nots and the way that they keep the have nots and they, they, have to, they have to keep them calm is the have nots have to believe in meritocracy. Mm. The have nots have to believe if we work hard, we can get to the top two. It's not possible. There's not enough space at the top for everybody. Otherwise it'd be shaped as a triangle and not as a, tri assume it's shaped as a as square, a square yeah. not as a triangle. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it's not possible for everybody to get to the top. There's not there's not enough space up there. But in order for the, the middle class to hold the structure together, because the middle class is in the middle and they and they keep they hold the top and the bottom together, the middle class have to believe that they can get to the upper class. And the and the people at the bottom, the poor or the have nots, have to believe that they can get to the middle class. So every once in a while you will see somebody get handpicked from the bottom and launched to the top. That's why you'll, you'll see things like people say, President Obama was a junior senator and junior senators don't become the president of the United States. He, he shouldn't have been in that position. Yes, he should have been in that position. He's done a lot of work to be in that position. He followed the rules and did the Harvard thing and X, Y, Z and boom, boom. But understand, Nobody gets in that position unless they've been hand selected and pushed. Hmm. And you have to also be hand selected and pushed. But seeing the possibilities increases the meritocracy and increases the belief in meritocracy, which is, which is important too. Yeah. People, I... need to believe, people need to believe that if they work hard, good things will happen. But we even know this in sport, but you people don't say it. If you you can work as hard as you want to. You're not going to be an Olympic gold medalist. And you're not going to be a Abu Dhabi submission wrestling world champion. But you won't know that unless you do the what? And do all the work. The work. <laughs> yeah. And that's what's devastating for some people. They do yeah. all the work and they find out it didn't work. Mm. But the people who got to the top say, hey, you're not here because you didn't do the work, which is also true. You're not <laughs> there because you didn't do the work. <laughs> Everybody who does the work is not going to get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I read, actually, I think, uh, I don't know if it was on your website. It was somewhere, something that you mentioned that, um, yeah, because uh, where did you rank in the Olympics? I can't remember the, the it was, was it 16th, that's it, yeah. And I remember you, you had a nice line saying that, you know, I, I, didn't, I didn't get the medal, but I did the best I could, you know, and that, that was where, that's where I was, you know, and it's, you know, like I, you almost can't... Uh, ask for much more than that. it's you know it's the, the typical expression do as best as you can it, it, yeah it, it doesn't stop you from going into the post-olympic depression it doesn't stop <laughs> you really have to reconcile that man i did the best that i could and my best wasn't it's not good enough to win mm. that's why i am i i believe that if you if we ran the numbers, if everybody in the weight class that I was in ran the 40 yard dash, I'd probably be the fastest. If everybody squatted and bench pressed, I'd probably be the, the strongest. So I'd probably be the strongest. But I wasn't the best judo player that day. Mm. Nor, nor, was I, nor was I the best judo player in the world at 100 kilograms. I believe that I still could have beat some people, but that's, that's not how it worked out for me. That's mm. not how it worked out. I ended up being one of the top 16 people in the world at the 100 kilogram division in 2004. And I'm cool with that. But then, then you also have this, there's a faction of people who say, hey man, he didn't do nothing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. No, this, but this, this, is how the, this is how the judo world is, you know? It's how the judo world is. Oh, he didn't do nothing. He doesn't know nothing. He didn't do nothing. He didn't do nothing. He didn't. Thinking to myself, it, it, I, I won two black college national championships in football, uh, two conference championships in football. Um, I got a special invite to the Abu Dhabi Submission Wrestling World Championships. I won four national judo championships. Um, I returned to judo in 1997 and made the Olympic team in 2004. I earned a medal in Europe. I placed third at the Pan Am Championships. 
I played second at the in the purple belt, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Pan American Championship, second in the Brazilian Jiu Jitsu uh, World Championships at purple belt. I ended up beating that day. I beat the uh, Chel Sonnen's head coach for Jiu Jitsu, and I and I beat Rafael Lovato that day. Um, <laughs> I I. And when I went to Abu Dhabi, I fought against my training partner, Jeff Munson, in the second round because we were on the same side of the bracket. We went to triple overtime that day, 25-minute match, one of the longest matches in Abu Dhabi history. And Jeff Munson won that day, okay? Um, I, I also ended up coaching for the Bahamas, took uh, an obscure country that nobody really knew about and produced the first youth Olympian in the Bahamas, taught the first class that was ever in school in judo in the Bahamas, got inducted into the Bahamas Judo Hall of Fame, been inducted to the Howard University Athletic Hall of Fame in 2014. Um, and my school's been around since 1867. They don't just, you know, grab anybody to put them in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> I also got inducted to the Hall of Honor um, at the Arnold Classic. And then as of late, I just found out I'm getting inducted to the um, African-American um, judo hall of fame in the united states oh, wow. so like congrats like these yes i appreciate it. like these things these small things they don't just they don't they don't just happen mm. i w- i haven't been around as long as some other people who started in terms of those people who are my contemporaries of my age with judo because i i started and i left and i came back mm the breadth of my athletic experiences are greater than any judoka that is coming in the United States. It's not one judoka in the United States who, who's done what I've done athlete, with, with the athletic breadth. Mm. It's not one. It's not even, there's not, there's not a, there's not an Olympian judoka in the United States who's had a head, head coaching assignment internationally. I'm the only one. Only one. I was, I, I was a head coach of a country, not of, not of a club of a country. It's no, it's nobody who's done that. Yeah, I mean, no, for sure. I mean, your nobody. your resume almost speaks for itself. It's uh... yeah, and it's and I man, I taught at the university. I taught at the University of Tampa. I taught at the University of Central Florida. Exercise science, kinesiology, and nutrition. And listen, I don't have a degree in exercise science. I don't have one in nutrition, and I don't have one in kinesiology. Not, not one. Mm. People say, how did you how do you end up teaching those courses? There's a place called the library, man. You can go on there. You can just read anything. And if you choose to read and choose to study, you can get it. I, I became a certified strength and conditioning specialist um, through the National Strength and Conditioning Association in 2001. Just recently, this last year, I let my, I let my, my certification lapse because I don't need the certification anymore. I, I've transcended the certification. My, the knowledge that I have in my head, I don't need to keep paying the people to do that. I, I read, I study. I'm still an editorial reviewer for the, for the um, Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research. Um, I, I still stay sh- sharp. I still study. I still do all those particular things. And I encourage all my students to do the same thing. <laughs> yeah, man. It's, uh, yeah, you're definitely, I mean, uh, a generalist in terms of uh, athlete, athleticism you know it's not just like you have one particular field um but just just to shift it slightly um just for me personally actually because i like i say i'm a dancer um like what role do you find creativity plays in jujitsu or judo um a lot I, mm-hmm. after after the foundational movements so mm-hmm. martial arts falls under the fine arts and what you'll find out when you do in brazilian jiu-jitsu is that your instructor can teach you guard passes and sweeps that so he can't teach everybody else because the vocab- your vocabulary of human movement is, a, is more vast. Everybody just knows the ABCs. You, you don't know the ABCs. You know the ABCs, you know, three letter words, four letter words, how to put together sentences and paragraphs and books and novels as it pertains to the vocabulary of human movement because you understand push-pull, level change, rotation, and locomotion. And you understand it from its purest form that we got from the, the Africans and the Greeks when they spoke about gymnastics. They, the way they spoke about gymnastics is not like the gymnastics is a sport, but gymnastics and the ability to move and the ability to have what's called kinesthetic awareness. 
your kinesthetic awareness is at a higher level than everybody else that's on the map because of the choreography that you do. Now, because of that, we take the fine arts and we move them into the space of being martial, which means being warlike. So you take those same dance moves because they're the same moves. The Tai Sabaki, the, the pirouette movements, all the movements that you're doing in, in martial arts, they're the same as dance movements, which is why capoeira can be utilized as a martial art. You take those same movements and then you learn the same thing you learned when you learned dance in the beginning. You learn the basic movements and the basic steps, the basic movements and the basic steps. And then once you cook your particular dish, you can season it as you like. I do not appreciate when athletes start seasoning the dish too early. Mm. I believe at the at the beginning levels, you like it's just like if you're teaching a dance class and somebody says, "I want I'm, I'm I'm doing hip hop dance." You say, "Hey man, hip hop is great, buddy, but that's not pure dance for us." Most great hip hop dancers like J Lo, because J Lo is a great hip hop dancer. If, if people understand dance, mm. they come from a quality dance foundation first. And then when they get that, then they learn the street stuff, which is easy to learn because the vocabulary of human movement is so high. The kinesthetic awareness is so high. On the martial arts side, same thing. Learn the basic movements. What I'm talking about, learn forward roll, backward roll, long rolls on the side, learn the backward fall to the technical stand up, learn how to pass the guard, learn the basic closed guard sweeps, learn the basic pendulum sweep, flower sweep, learn the basic chokes, learn the basic throws, one, two, rotate, one, two, rotate, one, two, rotate, one, two, rotate. Learn the basic throws, learn, learn the movements. And then when you want to season the dish, season it as you like. Mm. Yeah, for me, it's... Uh... I've, I've always got comments saying I've got good movement and I can pass guard well. But then as soon as I get to mount or so, I, I'm like, oh, now I'm here. And I'm like, oh, uh, you know, my, my technique sucks. You know, like I, it, it's like a, uh, it, it's like a, a fake, fake technique. You know? well, technique doesn't suck. Well, let's say my, my finalization or yeah. let's say a, a good part of it. <laughs> you just don't have as many reps mm. at that as you have with dancing mm. you just need more reps so when you're learning a new dance move what one two three four five six seven eight <laughs> one two four and five it's the same thing it's uh, one two three four five six swing the leg round one two <laughs> it's the same thing you got a uh, hand on the chest jump the shoulders turn swing the leg round finish over uh, and over and over again but here's the thing for somebody like you, dance practice is done. And I said this to somebody else. Okay. Yesterday I was on a coaching call. Sure. Transformative, the process of change, the beginning process of change happens in a group with somebody else, with the coaching in the classroom the true transformative change happens in isolation. So there's deliberate practice that you can sometimes do with other people. And then there's the element of deep practice that you have to do by yourself. Mm -hmm. Where the tennis player has to act like they're holding a racket and act like they're seeing a ball and go through the steps and the movements. <clears throat> you know this as a dancer, the deep practice happens when you grab your bag and you go into the room and you're by yourself, no mirror. And you're going over the movements over and over and over again. You don't have that ability to tap into that level of deep practice in jujitsu unless you have a dummy. You have to get a grappling dummy so that you can tap into that element of deep practice. So you can go through the choreography of your submissions from the mount or your movements from the mount. Yeah, I uh, I didn't expect that. Uh, that was that's uh, it's interesting. Yeah, because of course I, I I agree with you because dance like I'm a b boy, you know. So often it's quite a social um, 
quite a social part we all train together someone puts music on and everyone's just kind of you know doing their thing in whatever space they have and and often you it's like a constant source of inspiration because you can see people and you can draw from them um and then you know you never really get the same feel uh at home but but when you're on your own but i i understand that maybe that sorry you're not supposed to yeah, I, I understand. There's maybe a shift I need to take. It's this. This the, de the deliberate practice is boring. The deep <laughs> yeah. practice is boring, but that's that's the that's the the differentiating factor between the haves and the have-nots in terms of the acquisition of the technique mm -hmm. at that level. So, if my your brain, my brain, right now, your brain is taking in the light, the sound my hand movements, whatever you got to do during the day, the, the last argument that you had with your girlfriend, the last good thing she said to you, the, the things to do list that she gave you. Oh, I need to call so-and-so. I got to, okay, I got to, the cast was the end at this point. You're going over all these things in your mind. What we call, it's called noise, all right? That's what people say, click, it's called noise. So when you're in a dojo and there's people around, there's conversations going on and people are talking and there's social hour and the music's playing, uh, you're not using the maximum amount of percentage from your brain to focus on technical acquisition. There are certain times when I put music on and I put loud music on and I put music on and nobody likes it. Certain times when I play jazz, a certain time when I play soca, reggae, rock and roll. I put on some, some Russian rap sometimes because I got some people from Russia. In my life. So there's certain times, and there's certain times when I play no music and I'll say no talking. Because I'm trying to in increase the ability to acquire the technique and increase the person's brain capacity for the acquisition of the technique by reducing the noise. Okay. If you don't, re reducing the noise allows you to maximize, and I don't mean noise, just no, I mean all noise. Yeah, input, so yeah. if you're in the dojo by yourself and a mouse runs across the floor, that's noise. <laughs> you're not, you can't concentrate now on the technique anymore. You're like, shit, there's a mouse in here. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> you gotta be, you have to be somewhere where you reduce the noise. When I'm practicing by myself, I, dummies that are on the wall, I'm, I lay all of them on the floor because I don't want to do a technique and then the dummy, hum, then the dummy falls on the floor and it take me out of the zone. And even if it doesn't take me out of the zone, there's a there's, there might be a 0.5 or 1% percent percentage of awareness that's going over to that sound of the dummy that's not on the technique. Then there's certain times where I'll put myself on Facebook Live to inspire other people. Then there's certain times when I don't do any of that because I don't want that extra noise either. Dojo's quiet, room's quiet, me, dummy, one technique, an hour. Mm. One technique for one hour. Slowly. Not fast, not an exercise of conditioning, an exercise in perseverance, an exercise in discipline. The same thing you do with dance. Yeah. When you do choreography, I've done choreography too, not at your level, but I was a, I was the, the show dog for my fraternity, which means I was the step master. I taught the steps for the step show. Okay. When you're teaching, you go one, two, let's go here, one, two, three, four, and then boom. And then sometimes one, two, three, one, two, three, and go, and boom, 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 boom. And everything is slow. You've danced slow before, haven't you? For sure. Uh, yes. <laughs> Why? Because you need to lay down, you need to lay down the, 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 the neural pathway and then put the myelin sheath over it so it, that it thickens. Mm. But you have to do it slowly. Because otherwise, you'll you'll be throwing your hands up to get yourself around instead of moving your leg up to get yourself around. And you'll throw off the movement and it won't be crisp and it won't be clean. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that uh, that even to a certain degree, that's also when like you flow roll with a, you know, a good friend of yours and you, you almost, you're not 
working at crazy intensity of trying to win, but you're just trying to almost analyze what's happening. Sometimes when I flow roll with like a, you know, another blue belt, it feels like I have more time to actually understand how he did that or, or why I lost that position or, you know, when it's almost like a cooperative effort rather than competitive. It is. And let me tell you what, I flow roll with the following. My flow rolling is structured. Mm. So I have scissor sweep, recover, scissor sweep. That's the flow. And it's five minutes of that. And then it's scissor sweep. And then gas, scissor sweep, recover, scissor sweep, gas pedal, recover, gas pedal. Scissor sweep, recover. So the people are working together. When do you need to do the, the, the gas pedal? Well, if I'm doing a scissor sweep and I can't scissor sweep because the base is wide, then I gas pedal. Mm. So then they learn the reads. Then they flow that. Not random <clears throat> flowing, but flowing based upon reads. So the technique has to be right during the flow of the drilling. Okay. Otherwise, it's two blue belts or two white belts and they're flow rolling as the blind leading the blind. <laughs> But if I flow roll and I say, hey, I want scissor sweep recovery, flow rolling. Then I say, I want you to let the person get to the mount, trap the arm, knee bump, roll over. Now I don't want the person going to the mount. So as they go to the mount, grab the leg, step your leg over, move the other side, recover, boom. And then you start scissor sweep. <clears throat> you, you flow with, with a script. Mm. yeah it's almost like too and much then, freedom sorry go 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 too so, much freedom in the, in the beginning now people have a different philosophical approach with that i know kit dale is totally different when it comes to that mm -hmm. i respect his approach <laughs> no i respect his approach i i just know it to be incorrect i know from an academic standpoint it's incorrect He's looking at it from with the eyes of a black belt. Yes, black belts and brown belts and purple belts can't get in a room and do that. Two white belts. If I leave two white belts on their own, two white belts aren't going to flow themselves into a, a high level of proficiency or efficiency. It's not going to happen. Not unless a higher level rank pours into them or a blue belt who has been poured into from a brown belt and the brown belt was poured into from a black belt. Some, somewhere somebody from the higher rank has to pour something in that, in that, in that room for them to elevate. So mm. they're not going to be able to flow by themselves. So there has to be some structured movements that they learn in order to create what he calls a free flowing environment, but the free flowing environment still contains structure. When you and that other blue belt are flowing, you're flowing from techniques that you were what? taught mm. and you weren't taught the techniques by way of flowing yeah of course you were taught the techniques by way of standard a standard step process mm. and then it flows together after you gain proficiency then you can work on efficiency what i do is i reduce the noise or the thought of other movements and just make you really proficient and efficient at that one movement and then you can learn the offshoots. Hmm. If I get stuck here, then I do this. Because it's chess. Yeah. The ability that Hickson has that the white belt doesn't have is Hickson sees the openings, the flanks. He sees the whole board, the whole game, and he's 32 moves ahead. How do I put you to the point where you can grab somebody and you're 32, 15, 16, five moves ahead? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's true. Like you say, it's this, you ha almost have to be aware of all the tools that you have. And then it's the, the process of, of uh, the utilization of that. But it brings up a point of um, not necessarily in relation to Kit Dale, because I think he's a, a great uh, jujitsu player. Oh, but, um, yeah, he's a beast. He, I'm going to say this. He's superb. He's a superb teacher. And I've watched a lot of his stuff. Mm. Um, I don't, what he's doing is not incorrect. I just think there's what we call a parallax of vision. He's just looking at it a little bit differently. What 
as long as he's in the process and he's pouring in information to the people on YouTube, to the people who watch him, to the people in his school, it what he's saying is 100% correct. Hmm. The part that's missing is there is a step-by-step process of structure, A, B, C, 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 and skill acquisition that works. And I think he would agree. <laughs> yeah. What would you say is uh, the most like foundational point of of teaching? Like, what, what is the most important? Because I, I, you know, I, when I teach, when I tour and stuff, um, you know, it's it's often acrobatic movements, and so there's, you know, it can often fall into the. Let's say this: uh, there's many dancers that I know who are really great dancers who are not good teachers, but they still teach because they have this thing of just do what I'm doing, you know, just, just copy me, you know, and it's. The Les Twins are like that. I, I've never taken a class with them. I haven't really, uh, I'm, I'm not really into uh, hip hop dancers. I'm more a B-boy, so a bit more and contemporary. So it's a, li- a little bit of a different crowd, but I know who they are. Um, but yeah, there, there's, uh, there's a whole host of, of successful people who, who let's say they have a great trailer and they're doing some incredible, like out of this world stuff. But when it comes to teaching, there's, there's such a, a gap between what they can do and what they're asking uh, the students to do. And I, I wonder, like, um, what's the what's the, the like the the most important bridge? You know, is it communication? Is it like explanation, visualization? Uh, visualization, sorry. Um, is it no? That's uh... it's your ability to read the room. Mm. And read your personnel. Like you might go to it, you might go to it, you might, and let me say this. And this is why there's a difference between coaching and teaching. And then there's a difference between coaching, teaching, and seminaring. When we go to do seminars, we do with the understanding that everybody in this room isn't going to get it. Mm. You're teaching, your job is to make sure everybody gets it. The people who, who come see you for $1.99 a month, four to five times a week, they got to get it. When you're going for a seminar, you're getting paid $2,500 or $5,500 or whatever you get paid to do a seminar. You understand that some of this is what we call the dog and pony show. My job is to show up here, be really, really nice, have these people fall in love with me in the two, three hours that I'm supposed to be here. And then leave with the understanding that they want me to come back again, while at the same time teaching them some hard shit and not being hard on them. Mm. <laughs> those are those are teaching, seminaring, and coaching are all different. Coaching, I'm not even around you. I got a coaching relationship with you. You come in, drop in, the time to time is very different. But in all those things, the one thing that permeates the fabric of all those different processes is your ability to read the client or read the room. What you're talking about, you're not really talking about teaching. You're talking about going in and doing a seminar, all right? When you go in and do a seminar, man, you got to read the room. You see the 32-year-old lady who's a little bit chunky, top-heavy, apple shape. And then you see the slim, muscular dude who looks like he can play basketball. And then you see the the other short... 10 year old that, you know, the, the, the show, the showman, you know, that they, 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 all the stuff that they do looks cute because they're, they're young, but it's not all tight. But the first thing you need to see, you say, okay, I, I need to, I, I got to read this room. Let's start out with a couple stretches. And now you find out that that 32 year old apple shade woman has a background in yoga. Mm-hmm. And what you thought she couldn't do, she can do. So then you start and you say, okay, now let's warm up a little bit. And when you warm up, you see, you know what? She just eats poorly. Her conditioning is good. Mm. So now but the bag of what I was going to dip into, I can actually dip into that bag. It's, I, it, I thought I wasn't going to be able to pull those techniques out today, but I can. But I have to find a way to check so in this process does she have the upper body strength? Cause I know this, the young person does, and I know the athletic person does, but does she have that upper body strength to hold herself up at her weight? And you see, okay, she doesn't. So now 
because you read the room, you know what to teach and you know how to teach. Now you don't have to go through the room and make her feel uncomfortable and say, hey, the, I'm doing this move, but this is not for you. Because you come to find out that she paid for that 10 year old girl who's her daughter. <laughs> So that's yeah. your big money in the room. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> that's the last of the lady who's going to call you call you the personal private lesson at 250, 450 an hour. You understand mm-hmm. what I'm saying? But the reading the room is the most important thing in terms of teaching, coaching, and mentoring. And every time you come into the room, you got to read the room. On every Zoom call, you got to read the room. Mm. You have to read the room. If you and and the more coaching you do, the better you can read the room. Because you and me and every other coach, we've fucking read the room incorrectly before. <laughs> or stepped in stepped in the room with, with the understanding that we're going to do what we want to do. This is what they're going to get today. And this is what I got for them. Uh, and no, it, it, it doesn't work at all. Yeah. <clears throat> Not so at all. Would you say that it's, uh, would you say it's a good idea to, to teach? Let's say not as early as you can, but like, because you know you can gain a lot, of course, from teaching your own understanding. Um, like even when I, like when I graduated university, um, I almost started teaching straight away. So I, I and I was nowhere. I know for sure I was nowhere near as good of a teacher as I am now. Mm-hmm. Like right. yeah, and it's uh, but but because I'd been teaching for te- well, now teaching for ten years or so, I you know I, I understand like oh, okay, I was I was showing off back then. I was just trying to you know as much more like do as I do and. And I, I wasn't guiding them. I didn't really almost care at the time. I was just doing it as a job, let's say. Um, but it gave me the experience to, you know, that's allow me to grow. So is it something um, like, for example, in a martial arts sense, let's say, should a, uh, a purple belt start their own academy? You know? Um, I, I believe so. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. I mean, Why, as long here's you don't have to have a PhD to teach a child how to tie their shoe. Mm. <laughs> yeah. My 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 daughter is a I think she was a green belt in judo, green blue belt in judo. She she teaches my kids class. Yeah. And I think she teaches it better than I do because my patience wears thin, buddy. Okay, <laughs> it, it's very, it's very difficult. Uh, well. Teaching the beginner stuff is really, really difficult. It's harder yeah. teaching beginners than it is teaching advanced people. For sure, for, for sure, for, yeah. for sure, for yeah. sure. Um, <laughs> she just needs to know a little bit. Very good. That's it. Now, where it where it can get awry is when that purple belt is teaching things outside of their scope meaning if they're not a ibjjf competitive purple belt because listen you could be a purple belt and and not an ibjjf and an IBJJ, ibjjf competitive purple belt. somebody that's on the international Brazilian jiu-jitsu federation com- competitive seat i okay I'm a fourth degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I'm 45 years old. Remember, I could not be a competitive IBJJF purple belt. I could not. I've tried. I have to call time out, <laughs> look for some oxygen somewhere. I mean, they're, they're too fast, too good, too powerful. Mm. They know that they know the new stuff. And I can look at the new stuff and I can get it and I can go through it to know what to defend. I don't know it like that. I don't, I don't know like that. I don't know. I don't know like that. Hmm. I do not. Now, on the judo side, I could teach. I could still, but I, because I watch judo and I'm involved in it, I could still teach somebody to go to the high international level. On the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu side, I can be one of many coaches and help somebody. But if somebody came to me and they wanted to learn how to just become a uh, a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt world champion at the senior level, at the master's level, I can help you. At the senior level, I had to get some extra help. Now, what I, I'm saying that to say, that purple belt that you're talking about, if they try to teach outside of their scope, 
they can end up being disingenuous to their clientele. So if somebody comes in and says, but I want to compete in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you say, okay, I, mean, I can help you become a good competitor. I want to win the world championships. Mm. You, you have to be honest with that person and say, hey, I can teach you some quality Jiu-Jitsu. And then when you get to a certain level, you're going to have to go somewhere else. Or, or they accept you with the understanding they need, they're going to have to use some of your fees to bring in people to pour into that dojo or take some of those fees to bring in other people to teach them so they can pour. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, don't, I, don't mind, I don't mind anybody. I don't mind anybody starting a business. Cause man, that, that purple belt might start a bit. That's what I, that purple belt might start a business in an area that doesn't have any jujitsu. Mm, which often seems to be the case, right? Mm. They, they don't have any, yeah, they don't have any jujitsu. Mm. And if it, and if not for that purple belt, the people wouldn't be brought into the into the realm of martial arts. That's why I don't I don't talk trash about Aikido or Taekwondo or Karate or any other art because when those people move into the realm of martial arts, they become a potential client for all of us. If you're a lifelong martial artist, you will do Wing Chun. You will do some Taekwondo. You will do some Karate. You will do some freestyle wrestling. You will do some folk style wrestling. You will do some Greco. You will do some boxing. You will do some Sticky hands, Wing Chun. You will do some Salat and Kali. You will do some Krav Maga. Because if you're a lifelong martial arts, you'll find out that they all they all connect. And then when you really when you really study, you'll find out that they're all just dance movements applied <laughs> in a martial context. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh it it's been a crazy journey for me, like understanding just how, you know, the 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 connection between dance and martial arts is it's it's really just movement with a, a very very specific purpose you know it's rather than just the purpose of enjoying or you know a social kind of context whatever it's in, you da know. in, dance, in dance when you move you hurt yourself <laughs> in martial arts when you move you hurt yourself oh man <laughs> it's true man. It's, it's been funny like i've i've when i first started out i i had so much trouble like I had to do the opposite of what I was used to maybe like I would spread my way out a lot, you know, like in contemporary dance, we often, you know, work together and uh, contact improvisation or whatever. And it's all about like spreading weight in a cooperative sense. And then here I have yeah. to do knee on belly and I'm like, Oh man, but you know, I'm putting all my weight on my back foot, you know, and I, rather than my knee. And I'm like, Oh, I need to rearrange this, this, you know, this, this subtle thinking of, of, uh, it's, it's really the, okay. So move yourself into the realm of, let's move ourselves into the realm of the Latin dance genre. Okay. And you move yourself into salsa when as the lead, where you are, it's just, it's a subtle, it, it's, it's a subtle and the person knows. So <clears throat> when you are, when you have the, what we call when in judo, when you're Tory, when you're leading, okay? Um, or you're ahead in tempo, if we come from chess, your job is to create a, a movement to help the, the guide the person in the way that you want them to go so you can spin them and turn them. Your knee on belly pressure is actually a nonverbal form of communication where you say, I'm putting my knee here. I understand that I'm compressing your diaphragm and that you can't breathe. If you do not move, you're going to tap or you can use your hand and push against my knee. That is what I like you to do, please. Mm -hmm. When you move your hand and push my knee, boom, I can change and put my other knee. Boom. Now I understand that I'm putting pressure on your diaphragm. You can stay here or you can push my knee. When he pushes your knee, then you back step, boom, and then move yourself to the mount, boom. Now I'm in the mount now. I understand that I'm in the mount and I'm getting ready to attack your neck now. 
and you can allow me to attack your neck or you can present your arms for me to defend your neck. Mm -hmm. Slide your knee up to the ear. Absolutely fantastic. Now I'm getting ready to curve my opposite leg and move myself into the S mount now. You can reach your hand underneath there or you can let me finish the S mount. Reaches his hand underneath there. Grab the back of the head, roll. I've locked you right now into a preliminary form of the triangle now. <laughs> you have a few options. You can hide your hand behind you. You can stand up. You can lock your hands together. You can push up. You, you, you can do whatever you'd like to do here. I'm going to continue to put some pressure on you until you move for me. And that you're just having a discussion. It is literally a discussion and a negotiation. Yeah, that's uh it's salsa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when when do you get pissed off? You get pissed off when the person will not follow your what? <laughs> my guidance, it, my yeah, exactly, my exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh <laughs> uh, man. Okay, that's yeah, that's a, a nice way of thinking about it, man. It uh in just you know, I'm aware of the time, I don't want to keep you too long, but um the what what kind of role do you feel competition plays in in martial arts like in terms of do you uh, urge all of your students to compete is it um because i know in my like i do, I do I, urge my students to compete yeah because I, I i found that in the the times that i've competed just a handful so far but um it, it really it almost brings like an emotional sense to certain moves like i got uh i lost one competition from I think it was a double knockout. For, um, I got armbar twice and I literally, I went back and I was like, right, I need to work on armbar defense, armbar escapes. You know, it kind of gave me like a lot more focus on a particular thing. And I guess, you know, it, it can, like you were saying earlier, it can almost drill more uh, focus into the, the slightly boring repetitiveness of get this technique down. You know, this, like you say, skill acquisition of, of how am I going to, how am I going to fully, uh, understand all these options like you're saying from this position of being in an armbar or so um I mean I think that only came from competing you know it's there's a, a certain vibe in the you know in the dojo where uh, I guess maybe you're, you're too easy on yourself sometimes or is you know you're with friends or so or I'm not sure but yeah well, what's, what's your well, thing competition provides neural heightening <clears throat> because of, the, of, of the, the, the awareness that I can possibly get hurt here. <laughs> That's what does it. And then there's an emotional side where the ego does not want to receive a bruising either because you don't want to lose because there's people watching. So it, it makes you more aware of your situations and it makes you more aware of your position. So you, by, co by competing, you increase what's called situational awareness and positional awareness as it applies to the environment of play at the time, which is judo or jujitsu or wrestling, whatever it is. Then once you understand the positional awareness and the situational awareness, then you have to move to the next level, which is the constant state of readiness. So competition also allows you to understand, man, was I in shape? Was I ready in terms of armbar defense? Did I have what I needed? Did I have that constant state of readiness? Because you could be positionally aware. You could be situationally aware. Oh, okay, I see he has my leg. He's getting ready to sweep me here. I'm, I got my arm protected. <clears throat> and then you don't know what to do. So you don't have any readiness. Mm -hmm. So competition allows you to check in on positional awareness, situational awareness, and your constant state of readiness. Which is absolutely fine. That's what that's what competition will do. Now, that doesn't mean a whole lot for people who do martial arts for different reasons. Like they don't want to do martial arts because they want to know how to defend themselves. There are people who want to do martial arts because they like the social environment, they enjoy the fitness from it, they enjoy getting in shape, and they like the camaraderie for the for, that they get from the practice. That's great too because everybody has an, an opportunity to come to martial arts for their own reasons. I always try to encourage people to compete one time. Because, <clears throat> excuse me, you need to know, in my opinion, if you like the dish or not, based upon tasting the dish. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't force people to compete. 
I urge people to compete. I don't urge them to compete to the point where it becomes uncomfortable. Yeah. I also let people know those people who compete, they do get promoted faster than those who don't compete. That's just how it works. There's a competitive track and there's a non-competitive track. Mm -hmm. And I feel kind of bad for some of my students now because of the, the pandemic, they don't really have the opportunity to compete as much because there's usually tournaments going on all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's yeah. not a lot of tournaments going on right now. So I gotta, I gotta find something for them to do, man. A way for them to compete without jumping into a, a, a big competition. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it could be some kind of exchange between dojos or something in the local area or I don't know. Yep. Mm. Well, Thank you. That was a good hour and a half, I think. But um, yes, thank you very much for joining me. It was really an honor to talk to you. Um, like I said, when next time I'm in Florida, Tampa, I will definitely be passing by uh, to the dojo to you know stop in and try and get a lesson. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, is there any way for, for people to follow you? I'm sure you got Instagram and so. And, yes, uh, man, I got Instagram. Uh, on my Instagram is at Tampa Florida Judo. Then I'm at also, Rodney Ferguson, R H A D I F E R G U S O N. Um, and then, what I was talking to you about before, Luke, was the um, the 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 dummy training. I also have a dummy training program for uh, for people who like to drill a lot, and for those individuals who are going through the pandemic. Um, I, I have a dummy training program. You have a boxing bag, or if you, if you have a dummy, or if you choose to invest the money in a dummy, I think a dummy is like anywhere between two twenty or one hundred and forty-seven dollars, two hundred twenty dollars, which is a great investment, especially when you can't go to class anymore. Mm. Um, and you you can get my Matt Work Magic coaching program. You can find it at www.mattworkmagic.com. It will run you through. You get a new lesson every week for 52 weeks. And it's, and you get a certificate every month that you finish. It's absolutely fantastic. And also, I'm really, really huge on grip fighting yeah. as it applies to Jiu and Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And I have 100 free videos that you like to get. And you can jump into my Grip Fighting Academy for free. No credit card access needed for anything. Just go to www.gripfighting.com. And you can get all that today. Okay, <laughs> amazing, it. man. Yeah, I uh, yeah, I noticed you. You've got a great YouTube channel as well. You have uh, over a thousand videos or so. I think you got into yeah. YouTube really early, like two thousand six. You know, yes, was, uh, really good. Really yeah, really good. That was a good shout. <laughs> but um, yes, thank you very much for joining me for taking the time. I uh, really appreciate it. All right, man. Thank you, man. You have a great day, man. Bless up. Thank you. 